it. So welcome everyone to this week's Autonomy Talks. This week is a great pleasure to have with us Dr. Oya Celik Tutan, I hope I pronounced it correctly, uh, who is a senior lecturer at King's College London uh, in UK, uh, where she's also part of the Center for Robotics Research uh, within the Department of Engineering, and she's leading the Social AI and Robotics Lab. So something about Oya, she earned her PhD degree in Electric and Electronic Engineering, via collaboration between Bogazici University and the, the National Institute of Applied Sciences in France. And after her doctoral studies, she was a postdoc in various institutions, including Imperial College London, University of Cambridge, and Queen Mary University of London. In her research, she primarily focuses on machine learning and computer vision, uh, applying these tools to human behavior understanding and generation and human machine interaction. As you have seen from the bio, she has been uh, sponsored by a number of awards and won a number of uh, awards for her work. And uh, today she's gonna talk about robot learning from and for human interactions. And uh, I'm very excited to hear more about that. And uh, I leave the stage to Aya. And um, thank you so much for the introduction and thank you so much for inviting me to give a talk in your research group. So before I start, I would like to check something because in my screen, I see uh, also the do you do you see the when the I am pointer? sharing my second do you see the uh, videos as well faces or because it's occluding I'm not sure whether you see I can see only. I can see you yeah yeah I can see you okay maybe sh shall I close it to to make sure that it doesn't occlude the oh no I mean I don't see any occlusion in your slides so oh, okay okay I, okay, I see yeah. your pointer now is in the top right right now okay can be closed thank you thanks so much for confirming so yes um thank you so much for introduction so um is um so i am oya chekstan i am a senior lecturer in robotics at uh, king's college london and uh, today i'm going to talk about my work especially i am uh, very much interested in my special interest is uh, human behavior understanding and um, throughout my career i worked on understanding human actions and activities video sequences and then i continued with uh, understanding like, high level social phenomena uh, from human behaviors such as their engagement status when they are interacting with robots. And um, I would like to uh, start with um, a motivation video here. Uh, this video was uh, recorded uh, and we contributed to recording this video, which was um, recorded by Toyota Motor. Uh, Europe and Motor, uh, Toyota Motor Corporation to support Olympic Games. And here, this really explains our um, ultimate goal and how we see in the future that robots will be assisting us uh, in our daily life. So yeah, in this video, this really explain our motivation, I guess, because here the robots has very advanced perception and interaction 
skills and this is what we want. We are working on to develop algorithms to enable robots to support us in our um, homes and offices, workplaces and public spaces. But of course, the robots uh, in this video, the robot was remotely controlled by my PhD student and there is still a lot of work to be done to, uh, to reach this stage where we see robots helping us in this manner. So in this um, talk, actually, I'm going to um, focus on more two uh, broad questions. Uh, for instance, so how we can model human behavior from uh, multimodal data. And then also I will show some examples of how we can integrate these models into robots uh, for learning action and interaction. And of course, this is an interdisciplinary uh, problem. And this will also require us to work with international researchers from other disciplines. So uh, I will particularly here, you can see the a glimpse of human, uh, human daily interactions that as you can see, they are uh, collaborating with other, uh, others to complete shared tasks and they are coordinating their eye moments, gaze, uh, et cetera. And uh, here we are exchanging a lot of uh, nonverbal behaviors. Uh, for instance, we are looking at them when interacting with others, we are looking uh, at the same object together, we are coordinating our arm movements, also we are looking at uh, each other's facial expressions and then trying to uh, reach um, how the people, uh, other people in the environment they are feeling and we are coordinating our behaviors. And what, what we want to achieve is actually uh, to make the robots, the ultimate goal is to also equip uh, robots with similar skills so that they can also adapt their behavior in this manner and then uh, they will be better understandable, clear, and also we can, um, uh, we can also establish trust between humans and robots. And um, especially in this talk, I am going to focus on uh, nonverbal behavior. So what is nonverbal behavior? When we are interacting with each other, as I mentioned, uh, along with the verbal messages, we generate nonverbal behaviors such as facial expressions, arm movements, body movements, uh, and etc. And all of this information also contributes to uh, contribute how we co want to communicate uh, messages and or feelings and ideas. And this is why uh, humans they can really effectively use this information to coordinate the, their behavior uh, according to their interaction partner. And we want to make the robots to also uh, sense similar, perceive similar nonverbal behaviors and also adapt their behavior in a similar way if we are going to use them, for example, in our daily life. Here, um, as you can see in the video, that uh, the robot was able to understand when Alice died, the cinema, she was disappointed and unmotivated. Uh, so that we want to also make robots to sense also this kind of um, emotional states to, for example, take actions uh, for to support the humans. So one of the topics that um, that we can, for instance, if we can um, understand model nonverbal behaviors from videos, one of the things that we can um, predict is that uh, humans' personality. Personality is very important because it really uh, tells about how um, might our interaction partner behave and their um, habitual behaviors and thoughts and emotions. And there is already a uh, very a lot of work in the literature and most of them take inspiration from the, uh, this uh, big five personality model from psychology, which measures the personality along five directions, which is uh, neuroticism, emotional stability, agreeableness, extraversion, consciousness, and openness. And there is already a lot of work in the literature, both in the human agent interaction and human robot interaction. First, how we can analyze personality, how we can look at nonverbal behaviors, observable behaviors to detect personality, but then also how we can use this information to synthesize uh, personality for the robots uh, to establish or improve the uh, human robot interaction. And even there are some studies focusing on similarity rule, for instance, the robot and the uh, human should have the same personality, they should be both extroverted or also looking at complementary rules. You know, for instance, they should be having non-matching personality traits. And here, what I mean is uh, observational, observational behaviors is uh, especially looking at how people, they move their bodies and facial expressions and hands and whether this might give information, for instance, in this case, um, about their extroversion. For instance, in the model that is defined in the personality, 
uh, big pie for sense uh, model, uh, it mentions that the extroverted people, they display more facial gestures and hand gestures. And uh, also they talk, talk without hesitations, whereas introverted people, they, they are less um, active, they talk with hesitations and they are look less energetic. And I, after this discrimination, maybe we're looking at this video, you might be able to understand which person is more extroverted and which one is uh, introverted. So um, as I mentioned that uh, the first model, this uh, um, model that is initially um, developed is how we can uh, extract features from nonverbal behaviors as my mentioned, and then we can map them onto the uh, big five personality traits. For instance, in this scenario, we specifically focus on uh, a user and an agent. They are interacting with each other, and the idea was to extract features from the how the way the person was talking, their audio features, and then how they were moving their faces and body, and then we have used uh, long term term memory networks to uh, predict whether they were uh, extroverted or introverted and etc. So this is a typical system. But recently, we have been focusing on more uh, personalized models because also um, this is not applies to only personality, but any social phenomena like emotion, engagement, engagement, section of engagement when uh, for example, interacting with a robot because people tend to display this kind of behaviors differently. So it is uh, sometimes um, related to their gender, age, and also the cultures. For example, uh, I, uh, yeah, my, maybe this one of the observations, for example, Italian people, they do more gestures. Sorry, if I hope I'm not wrong. But yeah, so, so can we also uh, identify gen models? generate models by taking into account these individual differences based on the gender, gender, culture, and age. And um, what we have looked at is actually, for example, in this scenario, we uh, participated in the uh, ICCB UDB challenge. And here you can see that um, you, there are two people interacting with each other. And by looking at their nonverbal behaviors, the way they move their arms and fish faces and et cetera, can we understand their personality, predict their personality? And um, in this uh, setting, we have also investigated whether do we have a like equal distribution of different uh, user profiles so that we can um, build personalized models and based on our investigation we identified for example we built personalized models based on gender and also age um, for instance taking uh, into authority as the uh, threshold and uh, here uh, idea is um, was to, to again to extract so multi model features so not only using the audio and visual features but also what the, what they are saying and also the semantic contact uh, of their speech we took into account all of these features and the idea was to uh, predict the big five personality traits and what is the or this actually we won this challenge and the challenge uh, the winning solution was introducing this personalized model where we uh, instead of um, building a generic model, we build personalized model based on each user profile, whether they are female or and they are younger than 30 years old and etc. And this was help us to win the challenge. And here we have uh, combined different feature types, uh, as you can see, is the uh, input. And I'm going to, uh, and as I said, that we have uh, focused on, this is the details of the features that we extracted, not only visual features and audio features, but also textual features, uh, how much they were talking and the content, semantic content of their features. And uh, we used a neural architecture search tool, uh, build separate models, which help us to win the challenge. And uh, finally, this is also the uh, results that we obtained. In general, we found that uh, combining different modalities uh, provided better performance in this specific setting. So here, um, uh, this was an example of how we can develop models like algorithms to detect and model human behavior, but what's one of the potential application uh, of this kind of model, it could be like, for instance, in education. And um, here you can see there are two children, they are interacting with each other and there is a moderator, a robot, 
And in this scenario, we wish to uh, build an algorithm so that the robot can understand the engagement status of the children in the collaborative learning activity so that it can uh, provide some personalized intervention. And here we followed a similar approach, but in this case, uh, different from uh, the previous one we created, we learned from the data itself, from looking at this kind of nonverbal behaviors, we cre created user profiles from the data itself, instead of assuming user profiles uh, from the beginning, for example, saying that um, looking at gender, uh, females or males or age and etc. Instead, we learned the uh, user profiles from the data itself, especially we looked at the children uh, children's um, nonverbal behaviors, and then we identify different user profiles, for example, expressive explorers that are like children that are really engaged in the task being done, and they are displaying a lot of nonverbal gestures and then counting curves. They are still engaged in the task, but they are not so much active and the silent vendors. They are not uh, really engaged in the task. And here we again um, follow the similar approach, so I'm not going to uh, explain it from again, but we have uh, extra uh, in addition to the video features and audio features, we have also considered uh, log features that we have extracted from the collaborative learning activity and we apply the same technique uh, to uh, learn um, build uh, engagement detection model and uh, our results again show that the personalized models in this scenario significantly improve the performance and especially the speech uh, was one of the most important in, um, more informative feature to predict the engagement status of the children in this human-human uh, and robot interaction activity. Um, so, uh, so far I have uh, talked about how to model um, uh, nonverbal behaviors, but the next I'm going to talk a little bit more about how the robots uh, can using, for example, if the robots perceive the nonverbal behaviors, how they can react and respond uh, to such kind of behaviors. And uh, here, uh, for instance, um, again, from the video, you might remember the robot realized that Alista was unmotivated, she was tired, and then suddenly it uh, triggered an activity for the robot to uh, show the videos of uh, her when she was winning the, uh, the game, and then uh, this will help her to activate it, like motivate it again and continue practicing. So similarly, with that following a similar idea. So how we can use this kind of information, for example, to support human or also um, um, generate appropriate behavior for the robots. So one of the things that we are looking at uh, one example is how can robots navigate in human environments with social awareness using this uh, kind of nonverbal behaviors, how it, we can uh, make robots to uh, navigate an environment in a social acceptable manner. And uh, here the idea is, I don't know whether you are familiar, but uh, in uh, social gatherings when there is, um, uh, for instance, um, like a poster session in a conference or in a, a cocktail party scenario, people tend to form a specific uh, groups, conversational groups, and which is in the psychology, it is called a formation theory. As you can see in this corner, either there is talk with each other in like face to face or L shaped or side by side. And uh, this is a topic that has been explored by many researchers, but what we did differently here, whether we can recognize these conversational groups from robots perspective, and then how we can use this information uh, to help robots navigate a human environment that is shown in here. Uh, in a socially aware manner. And of, or, of course, um, this is how the um, data is uh, uh, from the robot's perspective, because it we used only the robot's onward cameras, and which is also we were able to use depth cameras as well. And as you can see, the task is not so easy. Here is a sample video. Uh, it is very different uh, from because the robot is moving. There's, there's people are occluding each other. And there is illumination changes, blur. And the video quality is also not great because the robot doesn't have very good um, onboard cameras. And um, the idea is whether we can detect groups uh, from the, this kind of camera, like video recordings, and then have robots navigate in an environment like this. And also, like looking at this data, also helps us to 
uh, gives insight how humans behave in an environment like this, for instance, uh, for instance, looking at this data, we have found that people most likely to form L-shaped groups or circular groups in an environment like this. And the group sizes are generally two to six. And um, also we have annotated these data sets uh, with um, frames with respect to the group annotations. And um, so one example is that, so as you can see the previous work, they were like focusing online, mainly a third person perspective, as you can see here, but what we want to achieve is actually to develop something, it can both work on the third person perspective and the first perspective robots camera perspective. And one of the approaches uh, that we have developed is based on graph neural networks, where you can imagine that each node here represents the human and the edge between them, uh, their relationship, for example, how likely they are uh, in the same group. And um, we use uh, these methods to detect actually um, the groups uh, as I showed in the previous video, and there are some more examples here to how to uh, detect the conversational groups in both uh, third person perspective, as you can see here, and then also the from the uh, recordings that we collected from the robots perspective first person videos. And uh, recently, uh, we also integrated this approach, this idea with uh, a reinforcement learning algorithm and to see how um, we can use this information to help robots to navigate in a socially acceptable manner. And as compared to the um, state of the art results and human, we uh, observed that even though um, uh, our method was not uh, like more or less at the same leveled in terms of the completing the task, but it found to be uh, based on the scores, it's the trajectory that the robot followed was much more smoother and its distance to humans uh, were like improved and then also the um, uh, distance to the uh, group centuries and etc. different qualitative quantitative metrics show that that or method was able to improve the uh, state of the arts uh, performance. And we also performed um, uh, Trink navigations uh, test, as you can see, I don't know whether you can tell me which one is human, which one is uh, the um, robot, the autonomous robot. Uh, but the idea also was to check not only quantitative um, metrics, but also the qualitative metrics to see whether our algorithm can be differentiated from a human controlling the robot in this specific setting. And again, we have uh, created this simulation using the uh, third person video that we obtained from the um, previous data sets. And um, now I'm going to show you another example use case where we can use a nonverbal behaviors, but this time to explain how the robots can explain their actions. And especially there is like, because there is um, a lot of work going on human robots collaboration. And the idea is here, for instance, in the case of a, um, a error, for example, if the robot does, does a, like a mistake, and then is this creates a, some sort of um, emotional, nonverbal behavior, observable behavior uh, in the, on the human side. For example, the person might be confused. And the idea is here whether we can detect this kind of behaviors from the observable behaviors when the person is confused or when they are they do not trust robots. And then this robot can use this information to explain uh, their behavior uh, to their collaborator, human collaborators. And what we have uh, focused on, in, initially we are now focused on, so far we have been working on human agent interaction, but currently we are also extending this to uh, human robot collaboration scenarios. Uh, in this scenario, we are especially interested in by just looking at the imagine uh, like a game, overcooked game, which I'm going to show in the next slide. By looking at only gaze patterns, can we understand whether the person is confused or the agent did something wrong so that we can use this information uh, to explain the behaviors of the uh, agents. And yes, so for instance, this is the overcooked game. Maybe you are already familiar with this game. Here, the idea is a like human and an autonomous uh, agent they are playing uh, a game to cook um, 
uh, like a task to complete a task collaboratively together. And what we did is because we want to also elicit some uh, observable behaviors from the humans that we have changed the uh, game a bit. For instance, we uh, embedded some uh, confusion triggers into the game. For example, we uh, hide some of the uh, ingredients so that the human would confuse because they won't be able to find them. And then whether we can observe this kind of confusion uh, states from the user so that the agent can make an explanation. And also we also program the agent uh, so that it can uh, do some errors occasionally, occasionally and so that this can, the kind of information also can be used for the agent again to explain their behavior. And this is how the game works. And um, probably, I don't know whether you have played this game before. And here there are some uh, ingredients and the human and autonomous agent, they are collaborating each other to uh, complete a task in a limited amount of time. And what we did is actually, as I said, this was uh, done for human agent interaction so far. And uh, we, uh, this is the interaction setup as you can see and the uh, participants, they were wearing eye trackers and then we recorded their um, eye gaze on the screen to be able to analyze whether they were confused or agents made an error. And uh, overall, um, what we found that we analyzed the results that we have found that actually the participants, they looked more uh, at the environment when they know what to do when they are confused. For example, when the uh, tomatoes were hidden, they didn't know about the next steps and they were uh, ideas scattered um, on the screen and they were really uh, confused. And, uh, and users, they look uh, more at the agent when agent made an error. And also, uh, if everything was going smoothly, they were looking at their own uh, characters. And um, this was like an analysis, but now we moved on to the next step. Can we automatically predict um, when and how to explain by looking at these nonverbal behaviors? And we have extracted some features from the, uh, this interaction uh, setup. For example, we looked at the uh, gaze coordinates and uh, their people diameter and area of interest. We extracted some features, gaze related features, but also we also extracted some task related in the features. And then we found that actually it is, um, results are promising. It is possible to identify the confusion states and the uh, agent error states and also like discriminate uh, the normal states. And this will give implications actually we can use uh, non-mobile behaviors to enable uh, agents to when and uh, what to explain. And um, I am going to continue with um, the last part of this talk, which is about um, how to also the, the uh, robots can generate nonverbal behaviors given their importance. And in the video, you might remember um, sport climber Shona Kahoksi. Uh, she wanted Alexa to play something, and then the HSR robot uh, it was so angry and uh, it threw the uh, Alexa into the rubbish bin. Uh, and actually, this is so interesting because even the HSO robot doesn't have an embodiment like humans, it is still, we were able to see from the video that it was still able to express its jealousy, uh, angerness uh, by displaying some lights and its moments. And the idea is whether can we also um, develop algorithms automatically, not manually designing this kind of behaviors, but can you also make robots to also display similar nonverbal behaviors uh, by using uh, data driving approaches. One of the projects that we are looking at actually to see whether we can really make robots to learn how to interact with humans by uh, watching human-human interaction and especially again, we are focusing on nonverbal communication in this scenario. And um, of course, uh, this is, uh, we started with, for instance, initially with a work with uh, also exploring with uh, some colors because the challenge is the embodiment between the human and the robot is really different. Even Pepper has two arms or um, a head, but their face is static, for example. This is why, uh, for example, we started exploring with uh, using colors, different colors to emo express emotion for humans, but recently, uh, we have been more focusing on co-speech gesture generation problem. 
So what does oh, just regeneration problem? As I explained uh, in the beginning, when we are talking along with our verbal messages, that we also display some um, hand gestures and body gestures uh, along with our speech to enhance the meaning of our uh, messages. And in the literature, there are some works which is focusing on rule-based approach, but recently data-driving approaches basically using, for example, in this scenario, can we have a, a data set of uh, TEDx talk, uh, talkers, like speakers, and then train an algorithm and then transfer it onto a robot to display uh, gestures similarly. Uh, this was uh, one of the uh, hottest topics in the latest years, but one of the open problem is, was that all of these um, approaches, they have been focusing on a one person in isolation, but what we want to do is to how to extend is to the scenarios where two people are interacting and ideally that one robot and then human is interacting. And um, so, as I said, so the idea was to whether really a robot can watch two people are interacting with each other and then learn how to generate a uh, nonverbal gesture generation, uh, generate nonverbal gestures uh, similarly uh, as uh, done in the human human uh, interaction. And we started with um, exploring with forecasting uh, task, which we also again uh, joined the uh, uh, participated ICC UDV challenge in this topic. And the, here the idea was to, uh, for instance, given a, a two people are interacting, can we uh, predict what is happening going, uh, what is going to happen in the future, so that the robot can adapt its uh, behaviors. And in this scenario, we have an observed window, like four seconds, and the idea is to uh, predict what is going to happen in two seconds. Uh, but this um, um, doing this by just using normal like uh, skeletons and hand pose um, from the videos proved to be really difficult. And uh, our latest paper was focusing on uh, motion capture data and specifically also focusing on more um, uh, affective context. For instance, in this scenario, as you can see, uh, people are interacting with each other. Uh, there is this agreement and disagreement scenario. When it is agreement scenario, their nonverbal display, nonverbal uh, behaviors are completely different. They are shaking their head, they are making eye contact, but as the, in the disagreement scenario, they are not looking at each other and they are like gestures is like very uh, active and energetic and they are shaking their hands. It's like it's much more different. And, uh, whether the idea was to also take into content, con take into consideration this effective context when we are generating gestures for the uh, robot. And here the general framework and uh, idea is we use the conditional uh, against generative adversarial networks in this scenario, and uh, we as an input uh, we give the interacting partners by the moments and their speech, but not the uh, meaning of the semantic content of the speech. In this case, we extracted features from the um, voice or audio of the uh, interacting partner. And then we, this was given into the uh, context encoders uh, module to encode the behavior of the interacting partner. And then to gather this information, then fed into the uh, generator to generate the uh, cost speech gesture for the target person given their speech. And here, as I already mentioned, that we have the context encoder generator, which is the uh, traditional conditional um, uh, generative adversarial network. And uh, as I said in this scenario, because we, uh, we found that it is really difficult to directly uh, use the computer region, like extracting skeleton from videos directly. In this scenario, we use a motion capture data set. And overall, or we show that uh, that we were able to be using the information from the interacting partner uh, significantly improved the performance. And uh, it was um, much better than the state of the art. And then also we found that in the uh, disagreement conversations, uh, it's much harder to generate the um, communicative gestures because maybe uh, it is much more variable and it is much more diverse when people are uh, in a disagreement scenario, whereas agreement scenario, it is uh, less uh, varied. And so this is also, this can be also directly also implemented on a robot to display uh, similar gestures by taking into account the um, 
uh, their interaction partner. And for example, here in an example use case in a hospitality scenario, we used this kind of similar approaches in a um, uh, recommender system like Pepper recommender system type of scenario where we put the Pepper robot uh, into a cafe in, or uh, in, in King's College London in one of the cafes and then also the Pepper generates similar behaviors uh, nonverbal behaviors and then we investigated whether uh, this um, displaying nonverbal behaviors have an um, experience what is the impact of the nonverbal behaviors on the uh, customer's perception and experience. Okay, so uh, this work is about, uh, of course, uh, in this work we have focused on uh, uh, created my whole speech gestures, but here it is really the agent here is not really aware of what it is generating. It is like um, really uh, not maybe an elegant approach, uh, but one of the, for instance, one of the, we can also didn't really uh, take into consideration how we can uh, map this onto another robot, which has a completely uh, different embodiment as compared to human, like a human support robot with one arm. And then in this scenario, how the robot can learn uh, to generate similar uh, coordination and gaze and et cetera, by taking into account the uh, differences in its uh, embodiments. And uh, for instance, one of the works that we have focused on uh, we uh, looked at the problem of observational imitation learning and uh, here we didn't extend it to the uh, human uh, robot interaction yet but here you can see another like an approach that um, because we can humans we can just simply imitate others by watching them and we wanted to see by looking at only one video can we also teach robots to uh, imitate uh, similar behaviors, but this is extremely difficult task because there is visual difference, for instance, um, uh, between the agent's domain and the expert's domain and the uh, agent's domain. And also, as I mentioned, expert and the agent might have different embodiments. And uh, we have developed a technique uh, based on, again, uh, very similar to like following the previous work that we have focused on the Gale, which is basically very similar to the GAN uh, architecture that we have discussed before. There is a policy discriminator and policy in this case, and uh, the policy generates a policy, and then this, this discriminator tries to uh, discriminate whether it is a by human or the agent itself so that the policy improves its um, policy to uh, convince the, to, to make sure the discriminator cannot discriminate between the agent and humans and etc. And uh, what we, uh, actually this is, as I mentioned, is very difficult task because um, first of all, uh, we wanted to achieve this without having any assumptions by purely looking at the video. And uh, the differences, visual differences between the experts and the agent domains are completely different uh, from each other. And also, even if the uh, observed behaviors, even if the experts displays the same behavior uh, due to this kind of differences, it can be uh, different uh, from uh, in different observations. And what we proposed here is uh, actually we, uh, what how we solve this problem is to um, proposing um, dividing the discriminator into two parts. One is the uh, pro, uh, proper uh, pro processor, and then the other one is the invariant discriminator. And then what the pre processor did is uh, to take the observations from the agent's uh, domain and then map them onto a latent space, which only encodes the information with respect to the goal completion uh, progress. But this, uh, regarding all of the other information, like the visual differences between the agent and the express domain. And then this uh, was taken as an input by the uh, invariant uh, discriminator uh, to create a discriminator score. Uh, and also to achieve this, we have uh, introduced many uh, mutual constraints, which I am not going to go into details, but this is just an idea actually, how we can use also the enforcement learning for imitation and then uh, how also, this is also like a potential technique to also to how this can be extended ultimately for uh, imitating human-human interaction. And here, some results that we have in this scenario that we show that um, 
we were able to do or method was effectively solve the uh, problem of observational imitation whereas there is uh, like a significant uh, appearance differences between the agents uh, environment and express environment and also there were differences in their embodiment and also we have shown that uh, we have um, shown that this method was able to work for high dimensional control tasks so <clears throat> Yeah, so I would like to conclude this talk by just uh, briefly mentioning that because in so far I have talked about uh, many different projects and uh, different robots, which are uh, generally they are really hard and rigid, but we also uh, want to look into how we can also explore this kind of techniques with any robot. And uh, currently, if you are going to visit London, we have a project uh, in display in Science uh, Gallery London which was a collaboration with AI Giants, which is a creative robotics company together, uh, which is worked on by my uh, students, undergrad students. And here we explore to these similar ideas uh, with a robot, as you can see here, which is an inflatable, inflatable, tuggable, really soft um, and very different robot. And uh, we also try to assign uh, this robot social intelligence, how it can detect people uh, within its neighborhood, how it can uh, generate behaviors. But of course, this is extremely challenging behavior because we also don't know how we can uh, generate behaviors for a robot like this. And we are exploring with different colors and uh, different movements for these robots to uh, engage the participants. Okay, so I would like to uh, find, I think in this from this talk, I have one only uh, takeaway message. So uh, I have shown different examples of how human behaviors can be used. And what I want to emphasize is actually we don't, uh, just when we are modeling humans, we shouldn't be focusing on physical characteristics only, but we should think about as a whole, and we should also uh, model like generate uh, human behaviors by taking into account cognitive and social characteristics so that we can use uh, more uh, like robots that can react and also imitate uh, human behavior in a, a more understandable, clear manner and also um, respond to like in a more effective way. So I think this is end of my talk and thank you so much. For it. I, I hope you are still there. I still couldn't get used to giving uh, online talks and I didn't see anyone <laughs> the presentation. I trust you listen to me. <laughs> so yeah, so this is the, yeah. Uh, thanks for the, of course, this was collaboration with uh, many people and uh, my group. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Oya, for the great talk. Yes, we are here, uh, <laughs> indeed. Um, let's open the stage for questions. We can, you can either raise your hand and not directly ask or write in the chat and I will read the question for you. Well, uh, oh yeah, if I can start. Yeah, um, start that, um, go ahead. Yeah, oh yeah, th th thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, definitely a different talk from uh, yes. you know, what, what we do, right? but very interesting. Now, something that I was, um, uh, actually the very first video that you showed, you know, had me a little bit puzzled. Um, what was the point uh, of that of that robot, right? Because at some point I got the impression that it was a very expensive coat hanger, right? So the person who goes out jogging, it just hangs the, the sweater, right? And then the, yeah, yeah. So the person comes back and they picks okay. up the sweater. Okay, so do I need the robot to do that? And uh, to tell me, you know, what my personal best was, you know, maybe I can do it on my watch, right? So um, yeah. it, it was not exactly clear to me what Toyota was, the point that Toyota was trying to make with that video. And also, yeah. uh, you know, more in a general, you know, how do you measure your success in doing this, um, like a robots for human uh, support, right? So I, I, I don't, don't um, you know, I don't know how to say, right? So, um, yeah. So I, I think at first to, to address the uh, first question. Um, so it was just a video to support Olympic Games. <laughs> Actually, it was mm -hmm. not nothing to do about research, and mm -hmm. they, they just wanted to make it fun and uh, engaging. So they didn't think. Uh, it was not a video that's uh, like really. You're not trying to sell that robot. 
No, no, no. They are not trying to sell the robots, but okay. it's just to show show that to, to make a fun video about support uh, mm -hmm. the Olympic Games. And yeah, there are like other use cases. Of course, they are not really um, useful for by maybe for uh, robotic applications, uh, like for example, to measuring the person best. Um, yeah, and then in terms of the like second question about uh, measuring the success, I think it really depends on the task. Um, and do you do you want to specify the task? For instance, if it is um, a collaborative activity, uh, it depends on the, for example, for the navigation um, task, let's say, uh, we want to, there are like a lot of measures, right? Because what we did, it, there was a point that the robot needs to reach in within the craft. And we wanted to check whether it can really reach the point. But we also checked, we used much more other uh, metrics, whether to see whether the trajectory was smooth, whether it got close to humans, whether it breached uh, these conversational groups, whether it was able to move to the target mm. uh, by taking into consideration the social rules. Mm -hmm. And we looked all of them together. So it really, and there is not one aspect when it comes to human robot interaction, especially for social interaction, uh, because we also need to think about uh, the success, but also need to think about other aspects. Mm -hmm. Like for example, one of the things that um, actually when you show the video of the robot navigating through that group of humans or right, to that crowd, we did something similar um, because at some point in our work on autonomous vehicles, um for some reason they gave us permission they didn't give us permission to drive uh, at the point we had a golf cart uh, on roads but we could drive it on the pedestrian areas where students were okay and then we were trying to figure out you know what to you know how to uh to do that but for example you know we did some research on you know how do you drive a car in an area where there could be pedestrian crossings and you know, at some point, the result we got was that, well, actually, the, the, the best strategy was to go, go in at full speed, <laughs> maybe, you know, you know, you know, like honking, right, so that people mm -hmm. would get scared and get far away from the robot, and then the robot could go very quickly and without getting close to anybody, right? But clearly, that's not something that you want. <laughs> right? yeah. so, so maybe you can put like big chainsaws and things is very you know scary things on your robot and then humans will be away from the robot no matter what it does right so in a sense you know there is a point of how the robot behaves but also how what is the behavior that it elicits among the humans that are next to it right so if the robot acts in a sense, is perceived as being very scary and aggressive. Maybe people will be away from it, but doesn't mean that people are happy this, this, about this, having the scary robot. Yeah, I think it's it's like a conversational topic because yeah. we don't also want to do it because we don't want to have robots that will change our behavior. Instead, we want to integrate the robots in our life, right? Without having to or change our own behavior. Okay, but but you know, I, I, so I mean, clearly you don't want that to be an aggressive robot or a scary robot. But for example, in thinking that when you are in a say in a cocktail party or something like that, right? Mm -hmm. Then maybe you see a waiter coming with a big tray of full of glasses or you know wine glasses or something like that. Then uh, you would kind of make a step back, you know, just to as you are going on with your conversation, right? And yeah, yeah, definitely. definitely so. Right? so you just do it out of, you know, just being a nice person, right? Um, mm -hmm. And I would imagine that will be will translate to robots as well. Right? Yes, yes, definitely. So we didn't look at uh, the whether the robot, how the robot should become a part of the groups, but there is already some people looking into that. So especially how a robot can join a group. And this is actually what happens because when people, they see a robot is coming, they will make space for it and then they adjust their position to make space for the robot. So this is definitely translates to the robot, but we didn't look at this in this particular study, whereas we wanted to uh, look at more how the robot can navigate in the environment by taking into account the uh, behaviors of the human. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, okay. So I think you know these are things that uh, you can talk about forever, right? So, but uh, so yeah, I just would like to give some other people the opportunity to ask some questions if they want. Mm -hmm. Is there any other question for Oya? Actually, I can go ahead with one. Maybe you already thought of that, but there is a big literature also on people trying to coordinate robots with themselves assuming they cannot communicate or, or so. Can, do you think you can apply your research also to understanding the, the intent of other robots, not other humans? Yeah, so this, so so that's a good question. So do you mean to understanding the intent of other robots? Yeah, or... I don't know. For instance, let's say, I, I mean, there, there could be many settings, right? One setting we have in mind, for instance, is uh, you have vehicles at an intersection that need to decide mm -hmm. who goes first. But you, you are doing more humanized robots, let's put it this way, not cars. Mm -hmm. And maybe yeah. you you have to you have waiters that have to serve different areas of a room, but they cannot tell to each other which which areas. So they have kind of to infer where the others are going. I, I, I think in some cases it might be useful to coordinate robots without assuming that they can centrally centrally communicate so much. Yeah, so oh, yeah, do you mean from also like from videos? For instance, yes. Yeah, that's, that's an interesting uh, problem. And um, yeah, I, I never thought about it, to be honest. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. Nice. Uh, maybe another question I had was, um, have you have you studied how to construct the training for all these algorithms you are developing? Because I guess, as you pointed out in the beginning, a lot of these things really depend on the on the kind of population you you want to target with your robot, right? The mm -hmm. example is, if I let a robot run in my own town in the mountains here in Switzerland, probably everybody gets scared. Uh, but mm -hmm. if you let it run in downtown Singapore, it might be the case that some people already seen some some kind of automation in their lives and they are more relaxed around the robots, right? So mm -hmm. uh, this this very important and open problem because currently mm -hmm. we don't really uh, have data sets to build fair and unbiased algorithms, but we start looking at uh, also how to solve the uh, fairness, mitigate the um, fairness of sorry, ensure the fairness in also the algorithms by like looking at, we started looking at uh, algorithms, development algorithms, because it is not possible to collect data, especially video data. It is really difficult, but rather than we are more focusing on how we can embed um, this in the uh, algorithm so that we ensure that we have a fair algorithm, which is not, for instance, working on a specific population, but uh, it is working equally well uh, for, uh, all the people. Okay, very interesting. Thank you. Is there any other question for Oya? Doesn't seem so. All right. Uh, I think you left your contacts, uh, and and people can reach out to you for for deeper questions in case uh, they have follow up questions. Uh, thank yeah, you sure, very sure. much, Oya, again for thank the great you. talk, and uh, I also you. wish you good luck for the. For the next steps, I hope to see some uh, of these robots around uh, very soon. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, uh, Julia, before we say goodbye, I actually have a few other. Uh, oh, know, oh, yeah, go ahead. Me, yeah. Um, yeah, oh, yeah, I found very interesting that uh, the, the huggable robot that uh, they just shot uh, is kind of, kind of, kind of neat. Um, I don't know if that is the case in the UK or or you know Italy or other places or but um, you know for example here in Cambridge in Boston you see sometimes places you know people who are you know standing in the middle of the square and offered free hugs. <laughs> okay, <laughs> right? interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's kind of funny. So do you mean in Cambridge? In, in Bridge, the uh, you know the, the the fake one, you know the the, the American ah, one, the one in, okay. in Boston, right? Um, I, I don't think in the UK one they would offer free eggs. Uh, that's my <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. I, I think it's so surprising because also we put this robot and pay, people they tend to hug it because it is soft and huge and displaying colors. It's it's really uh -huh. interesting, but they don't feel like they want to hug 
other robots, for instance, if they see uh -huh. like a mobile mobile manipulator, they don't. It doesn't trigger that kind of uh, behaviors in the humans. This is also interesting to see. Mm -hmm. No, okay, but well, first of all, I, I'm sure that my kids will love to have that huggable <laughs> thing. <laughs> but anyway. Um, You know, something that kind of like I, you know, kind of surprises me, and uh, you know, I don't really know how to, to what to think of it. Is um, you know, sometimes, for example, in the Japanese literature, uh, you see a lot of discussion about robots for companionship, you know, especially mm -hmm. for older people, right? That they, mm -hmm. they feel lonely at home, uh, and then the robot can actually alleviate some of that loneliness. Um, also, I'm getting a lot of, you know, ads, uh, you know, I don't know if you guys get that thing too on, on Facebook or Twitter or, you know, this social network about now you have these AI powered friends, mm -hmm. right? That you can WhatsApp, you know, like, uh, I, I don't know, you know, how would you interact mm -hmm. with this? But and it seems to me that there is this tendency of looking at robots or interaction with this also to alleviate feelings of loneliness in humans, right? But um, I don't know if you have any thoughts on on this. Yes, uh, so uh, I, I think definitely because there is this para robot and hero chan robot uh, from Japan mm -hmm. that are like uh, specifically designed for to address the loneliness, healing effect, to provide a healing effect. Uh, for elderly people, especially Hirochan is a, like a small baby shaped uh, mm -hmm. robot, uh, and uh, it's really uh, it's it's really created like a, like a baby. It can cry or it can laugh, and elderly people they found it really um, really uh, really healing effect. It really provides this healing effect when interacting with it, hugging it, and etc. So it is really uh, useful, I think, in terms of uh, this kind of applications. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, I don't know what to think of it. You know, sometimes I think that well, okay, so it's great that it has this healing effect, but are we really at the point where we need to, you know, take care of a robot to feel, you know, better? Uh, yeah, I think it depends. Uh, um, it, it, I think there are like a couple of um, things. For instance, for for instance, whatever we do, we focus on participatory design. Uh, mainly to, to take into account the, what they need, the users they need, uh, for instance, from a robot and what they want to do, the robot to do for task for them and what they, they don't want to do. And in, in particular, in this scenario, uh, for instance, there is also a shortage in terms of the caretakers uh, and uh, it is not possible for uh, like a human to like really a human caretaker to be with someone with 24 mm -hmm. years, 24 hours. For instance, I participated in one of these workshops and I talked to a mom and her child was had autism. And she said, it is so tiring for me because he doesn't want to stop. I need to interact with him all the time, but his also behaviors are like mm. repetitive. And it is so tiring because it is not a, like a, a, a two typical people are, uh, interacting is a different interaction because it is someone that is interacting with this is uh, behavior is so repetitive and different and she was really exhausted and for example for this kind of application if the robots can at least a couple of hours play with the child that then the, uh, the caretaker can take some break and they can also maintain their uh, well-being thank you yeah. So I think for, for to understand better how the robots might be useful, it would be really useful to talk to the uh, tribal users, families, with they have really have like relatives uh -huh. and family members having like diseases and etc. And yeah. then it will like help us to better understand how we'll be uh, useful so, to the robotic technology. But also what is this is in a sense is like a, like a multiplier or something that you can leverage. There is a human behind it, you know, there is some human interaction behind it, but then mm -hmm. the robot you serve as a, as a multiplier. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. It is not to replace the human interaction completely, okay. Okay. but at least assist 
human mm. when necessary so that the uh, human for example the caretakers they are now in the uk they are complaining because then they go to a patient's house they need they spend all the time for cleaning the house or doing the you know cooking and etc but what if a robot can take care of the cooking and the cleaning so that they can interact mm. with the patients like have a chat with them coffee with them so it they can like spend and um, more um, um, valuable time with the patient rather than doing only the, this kind of daily tasks. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very nice discussion. Anybody uh, has another thought? Okay. So, oh yeah, then I think you deserved your evening now <laughs> <laughs> after this nice discussion. And as I said, I wish you good luck for the next steps. And uh, yeah, thank um, you and good luck for you as well. <laughs> and thank you. Uh, thank you so much again. Really nice to meet you. And thanks so much for the inter interesting questions and discussions. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Bye. Have a good night and see you all next week for the next talk. Bye-bye.